Coming up on this episode of the Salesman Podcast. Consistent results come from consistent activities. When we think about kind of the manufacturing operations end of our businesses, we know that our products are good because there are consistency in engineering and product development and manufacturing. But the same rules apply in sales. Consistent sales results can only come from consistent sales activities, regardless of the technology and the medium we're using to talk to our customers. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most listened to B2B sales show. If you haven't already, make sure to click subscribe and let's meet today's guest. Hey, everybody. Weldon Long here, author of the New York Times bestseller, The Power of Consistency and Consistent Selling. Really excited to be on the podcast. We're going to talk about getting the mind right, getting the sales right, and getting your consistency right on an ongoing basis. You can check out my books on Amazon or visit my website, weldonlong.com. On this episode of the show, with Weldon, we're diving into consistency. And that sounds like a bit of a boring topic. It's not. This show is fire. This is one of the best shows we've done all year. There's emotional stories within it. There is essentially the, the power of consistency and how it helps you go from thoughts to emotions, taking more action, how you can set goals that are bigger than you could ever possibly imagine. It's a real fire episode. I promise you that. Stay tuned to the end for some real insights as well from Weldon that's I've taken on board personally, having recorded the show, and I'm implementing right now as we speak. And with that, let's jump right in. And just to tee up the show here, in a world of, and I'm guilty of some of this, two-minute videos and, and talking about hacks and tricks and shortcuts and Instagram fame and seeing people going from seemingly zero to having a Ferrari overnight, is consistency... Uh, potentially something that's underrated right now in, in the world of business and sales. Well, absolutely. Now, let's let's not knock the Ferrari because I, I do have one, but I didn't get it overnight. You're right about that. Uh, there really are no shortcuts. You know, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, in this day of instant communications and uh, seemingly overnight success, you know, consistency really is the key. It's a very simple concept. Consistent results come from consistent activities. When we think about kind of the manufacturing operations end of our businesses, we know that our products are good because there are consistency in engineering and product development and manufacturing, but the same rules apply in sales. Consistent sales results can only come from consistent sales activities, regardless of the technology and the medium we're using to talk to our customers. So is it fair to say, and I don't know if there's data on this or if this is anecdotal, but is it fair to say that high performers in sales are all consistent or are there still the, the unicorn people who have the gift of the gab or they have some random skill that allows them to have success without consistency? Yeah, you know, having worked with thousands of salespeople, there are some seemingly unicorn type people, people that are so good at communications, building trust and, and you know, creating dialogue uh, between themselves and their, and their prospects. But I find even the most skilled, they still have a bit of a process. At the end of the day, there's four components to any sales process, no matter how new you are or how old you are. There's four steps. You've got to build a relationship. You have to investigate your prospects' problems. Of course, you have to have solutions for those problems. And then you have to ask for the order, bring the sales call to a conclusion, not necessarily a close, which we'll talk about today, because I think that's a huge misconception in sales. It's not necessarily about closing every call because no one's going to have 100 percent conversion rate. It's about bringing every sales call to a reasonable and a logical conclusion. But those four components are in every sales process from the most skilled, as you were referred to as the unicorn, the super talented, just off the charts, uh, you know, productive salesperson and the new person. Those four components have to be there. So one of my one of the things I'm embracing this year, not necessarily New Year's resolution, but more uh, a principle for having greater success is the, I don't know who said this, if it's a quote or just a cliche of, the way you do one thing is essentially the way that you do everything. So I'm looking to have more consistency in all areas of my life as opposed to just in sales specifically. So with that said, Weldon, is this something that high performers, other than just in business, you know, athletes or entertainers or whoever it is, do they all have consistency in their world as well? I think the highest performers do, and, and you use the sports metaphor, and that's a great example. You know, if you look at the, the best athletes, they will tell you that they're very process-driven. You know, in sales, just like in sports or business, there's kind of the process of sales, and there's the outcome of sales. There's the process of playing football, and there's the outcome of the game. We have very little control, actually, on the outcome. At the end of the day, our customers are going to decide if they want to buy something from us or not. What we have 100% control over is the process. And if you keep running the process over and over and over, eventually the results will take care of themselves. At the end of the day, the customer gets to make their decision. We can influence their decision. In other words, the better we do our job, the more likely they are to say yes to us. 
But at the end of the day, our job is to diagnose problems and recommend solutions. Our prospect's job is to buy them or not to buy them. Far too many salespeople get hung up on the close rate and the outcome. You don't even control the outcome. You got to stay focused on what you control, which is your ability to earn trust and build relationships and run your sales process. So you say the ability to control, but as we touched on before we click record, I am terribly inconsistent. This is something that I've, I'm consciously having to focus on. And uh, as a kind of sidetrack note that got me onto all of this and, and kind of made it a huge focus for me, we're developing a sales personality um, uh, kind of typing system for our, our sales training product, the sales school, so that people can go in and see, well, perhaps you're predetermined to this or you're predispositioned to this. And so this training might help or this training might help, kind of like long story short. So I started doing a bunch of personality tests, learned more about it, had a few people to help with uh, the process of building it. And it blew my mind that my personality type, I can't remember the numbers or the acronyms, but essentially it said creative and is unable to focus on one thing for more than 15 minutes. And so the the advice from the kind of the product that we've built that's kind of airing shortly is that if I can focus on keeping the creativity, but having more consistency and focus, that will turbocharge the results that I'm having. So with that said, um, you use the words or the, the phrase, on the lines of it's something that we're in control of. How do we become more in control of it? Because I, I know physically I can, if a gun to my head, I can do X, Y, Z consistently for a few weeks, months, or years or whatever it is. But when there's no gun there, how do we implement this and, and make it happen? That's a really great question. And, and I would just first say that I would never undermine or, or understate the value of the creativity in that part of it. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to make us successful, too. It's why you're so successful with your show and your products here, because of the, 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 the creativity, the entertainment value, just talking to you, the expressions on your face. You know, it's kind of that cue factor we talk about that some people you just like to interact with because they're interesting. So that creativity part is really important. But doing the same things on a consistent basis are so important. But we can create that habit in our minds. Let me give you a little background. I didn't start out this way. I was a terribly incompetent, inconsistent knucklehead for 25 years of my life. I'm not sure if you're uh, aware of my background, but I spent 25 years of my life on the streets. I was a ninth grade high school dropout. I went to prison for 13 years. I was a complete knucklehead and a loser. And so it was in my, uh, my prison sentence. I went to prison three times over 15 years uh, for a total of 13 years. But about 22 years ago, 23 years ago, in, J in June of 1996, I was in prison and my father died unexpectedly at 59 years old. At the time, I had a three-year-old son that I was not a father to. I had fathered him out on parole and came back to prison. And I started looking at my life for the very first time. And what I realized as I started studying and learning, I made this decision. I was going to be a son that my father would have you know, been proud of. And I was going to be a father to my son. That was my, my two driving things. And it has been for 20 some odd years. But what I realized is that, you know, I had some aspirations and some goals, things that I wanted to accomplish in my life. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to have a home. But I realized that my values and my habits were not consistent with those goals. In other words, I had the goal of wanting to be successful, but I didn't have the habit of educating myself. I didn't have the value of self-discipline and postponing gratification, the things we need to be successful. So as I began to learn and study this, I began to realize, okay, I got to have these goals. These goals are great but I have to have values and habits that are consistent. So how do I create those habits? And what I learned over my study is kind of the classic Emerson philosophy that we become what we think about all day long. When I started on this journey 22 years ago, I'm sitting in a prison cell. I still had seven years left to serve. And I came across a quote from uh, Frederick Nietzsche. Nietzsche said, we attract that which we fear. And I remember thinking that and like, why would I attract things into my life I don't want? Why would I attract things into my life that I fear? So I kind of dismissed it. A couple of months later, in the summer of 1996, I was flipping through the pages of the Bible. I came across a, a, a scripture in Job. Job said, Father, that which I have feared has come upon me. So I started realizing these things that I fear, my habitual thoughts were all manifesting in my life. And so I started thinking about, okay, how can I habitually change my thoughts? How can I rewire my brain? And I started studying the neurology, and I've got 103 IQ and a ninth grade education, so I had to keep it really, really simple. And what I learned is that when we have a thought, any thought, good, bad, happy, or sad, it goes into a little part of our brain called the hypothalamus. When the hypothalamus gets that thought, that energy, that little bolt of electricity in our brain, we begin to secrete a chemical, and the, and the chemical triggers the emotion that will be consistent with the thought. In other words, if I get frightened, I start producing epinephrine and adrenaline. I have a frightened emotion. If I get happy, I start producing 
happy thoughts and then I start getting this dopamine and endorphins. And so I started realizing if I control my thoughts, I can drive better emotions, which will drive better actions, habits, which will produce better results. I talk about that a lot in, in, uh, in The Power of Consistency in, in my second book. Uh, and we can talk more about that process. I don't know how much time you want to spend on that, but it really came down to reprogramming the neural connectors in my brain to start making decisions that were consistent with my goals and, and, and developing a value system that was consistent with those goals. Um, well, we'll come on to that in a second because clearly that's, that'll be the crux of the conversation, the, the real practical steps uh, we can implement here. But there's two things that popped up. So I kinda, I'll ask you kind of one and then the other. The first one, so um, I, I've never been to prison. I've had a really just average upbringing kind of middle class. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm too soft. <laughs> I'm way too soft for prison. I, I, I trained Brazilian jiu-jitsu and I get beat up there enough. And uh, I, I dislike that most of the time I'm there. But that's, that's slowly toughen, toughening me up. Um, but yeah, so, but the point being, I've, I've had a, you know, um, a relatively comfortable, you know, my parents aren't particularly rich or anything, but they're always there for me. They were, they were together, they were divorced, all this kind of stuff. Two and a half years ago, my mom died of, of cancer, um, at a relatively kind of like youngest age. And that was my kick in the ass of, um, you know, I, I thought it was a good son, all that kind of thing. But I thought, you know, if, if mom could pass away at this, and I've got her genes, uh, you know, I can do things to improve my health and, and kind of hedge my bets on certain things, but I need to get my kind of arse in gear and, and, and get stuff done. And that was a huge motivating kind of factor for me. And and I know maybe 50% of the audience will have had an experience like this that they can relate back to and they go, right, that was a game changer. What I want to ask you though, Weldon, is for the over 50% who perhaps have had just a comfortable life, they've not had anything necessarily hugely bad or good or no windfalls or no, no losses, do you need a, a kick in the ass moment like that to be able to implement some of this stuff? Or is it possible to do it without that kind of catalyst? That's a fantastic question. And one I've never actually been asked before, because I think we always assume that people have had some bad thing happen in life, like losing their mother or losing their father, going to prison. Uh, but you're right. I think there is a big percentage of folks out there that haven't had that. And what it comes down to, I think, first, I will say, I believe there is a relationship between the amount of suffering that we experience and the amount of success that we experience, because it can be a huge motivator. I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan, and Tony talks about the two big motivators in life. You can move towards pleasure, or you can move away from pain. Moving away from pain is a far bigger motivator than moving towards pleasure. But it doesn't mean it's not impossible. You can still have ambitious goals. One of the things I tell people that when I'm speaking and I'm teaching, I'm training and I'm reading my books and I'm talking to them, they'll say, well, you know, I've I talk about three areas of your life, your money, your relationships, and your health. And you got to be consistent across all three. We can talk about that some more. But they'll say, you know, I have a really good income. I'm retired. I'm set financially. My health is great. Uh, my spiritual health, my physical health, my relationships. I've been married 30 years. I've got a wonderful family. What's supposed to motivate me? And the thing I always come back to is a single word, is and it, that's contribution. I was going to say, is it Ferrari? Because I thought that was what but, was coming then. <laughs> Uh, the, the Ferrari is the benefit of the contribution. <laughs> but it truly is the case that the more we receive, or the more we give, the more we receive. When Tony, my very first book was a book called The Upside of Fear. And I was very fortunate. It was an autobiography about my life, won numerous awards. It was what really got me into the writing and speaking business. And I was fortunate enough to connect with Tony Robbins, and he endorsed the book. And his endorsement read, congratulations on your turnaround from prison to contribution. He didn't say congratulations on your turnaround from prison to a house on Maui right? It was the contribution. And so I think everybody is motivated by contribution. If somebody has it really good and they don't have a lot of pain in their life, well, I mean, you go back to the old Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? What's the final need? Self-actualization, making a difference, a contribution. You know, one of my big inspirations and uh, a man who became a very good friend of mine before he passed away, endorsed my books, was uh, Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits. And many people don't know, Dr. Covey wrote another book called The Eighth Habit. And the eighth habit was, habit was finding your voice and making that contribution, spreading your message, spreading your light, you know. And so I think no matter where someone is, if they haven't had the suffering, then look to how you can help others, make a contribution, whether it's building a, 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 an orphanage in, in Ethiopia or maybe a Little League team in your hometown. It doesn't matter what it is, but extend yourself emotionally, financially, professionally to help other people. If there's something that you really want that's a big enough goal – that you want to go to, then great. That fear or that or that that pursuit of pleasure may be enough for you. But most all of us have some pain. Dig into that pain. Use that as your motivation. If that if if, if you had a charmed life, I get it. 
then look for the contribution of the big goal, that big audacious goal that gets you up in the morning, gets you excited. And then once you figure that out, it's a pretty easy process to get there, believe it or not. Love it. So we'll come on to the process in a second. But something else you mentioned, and I, I don't want to kind of dive in too personally on this because uh, I don't know how whether you want to discuss it or not. But you mentioned um, reading the Bible. Can I ask, are you a, a religious man? Uh, I wouldn't say I'm religious. I'm deeply spiritual. Uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, in terms of an organized routine religion, uh, I wouldn't go that far at all. But I'm a deeply spiritual person in that when my father died, I was 32 years old. And I was at the time essentially an agnostic. I wouldn't go so far as to say atheist, but I just wasn't sure. But you've heard that old saying, there's no atheist in a foxhole. <laughs> well, when you're in the kind of pain I was in, lost my son, destroyed my life, lost my father, I was in an emotional foxhole. And when I got there, I needed some help, man. And I remember one day laying on my rack on my bunk and I was sobbing. It was a few days after my father died. And I had the sheets over my head so that my cellmates around me wouldn't see me crying like a little baby. I was 32 years old. And uh, I started thinking, and I guess it kind of turned into praying or meditating or whatever you want to call it. And I just began to say, you know, if there's anything out there, I, I really need some help here. I'm the least deserving person on the planet, but I have destroyed everything around me. And this is the best I've been able to do on my own. And I'm telling you, when I experienced said that I experienced what I consider just like a warmth for maybe 10 seconds. And like in that moment, I knew I was going to be okay. I had seven years left to go in prison. I had so much work to do. I had to become a man of honor, character, and integrity. I had to get an education. I had to change my value system. I had, I had so much work to do, but I knew in that moment I was going to make it. And since that moment, I've always thought that, you know, people will ask me all the time, how did you do it? And I tell them, I didn't do it. It happened to me. And it's a huge difference. And so to that degree, I'm very spiritual in that I believe that there is a universal intelligence, a universal being, whatever you want to call it. Uh, a lot of people call it a lot of different things, but I personally feel a lot of energy, direction, and clarity that I get from that source. And the reason I ask, and regular listeners will will know this because I've, I've asked similar questions before, but I, I'm an atheist, and I sometimes feel like that could be a disadvantage. So I wanted to ask you, Weldon, having faith in something you know, however you want to describe it or, you know, and other people will describe it in other ways, but having some kind of faith, does that allow you to be consistent for longer periods of time, not with less effort, but does it enable that? Because you can say, well, I'm being guided or I've got a 20 year plan and I'm being guided on that. And, and that's going to kind of help me get there. Is that, is that an advantage for people perhaps? I don't know if it's an advantage uh, you know, we're all so unique in our, in our individuality and what we believe, and what we think. I don't know if there's an advantage. Here's if there is an advantage for me personally, and I can't speak for you or anybody else for that matter. But when I've had really tough times, like when I made that decision in 1996, I still had some tough years ahead of me, right? Sure. Uh, there were a lot of really, really tough times. And there's, and I don't, I'm not like a big Bible thumper. I don't read the Bible every day or even every week, but there are some scriptures I've read over the years that jump out at me, just like James Allen or Napoleon Hill or Jack Welch. Or, it's just, I mean, it's good stuff, all right? It's definitely, I believe, inspired from somewhere beyond mankind's own, own brain. But there's a scripture that says, even as I walk the shadow of valley of death, I fear no evil, for thine is with me. And, and, and that's a thing that has helped me through so many difficult times. When I feel down, I don't feel alone. I feel like, okay, you know, it's kind of like man's search for meaning, Victor Frankl. What's the purpose of this suffering? What's the meaning of this suffering? Uh, what can I do good out of this difficult situation? And it's it, it's that belief and then feeling I'm just not alone. Like, and, and maybe it's delusion, right? But it works for me. Right? <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's like cartoon strips. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I could think of Bart Simpson and he could pull me out of this mess. But the bottom line, it works for me. And I think there's something about the comfort in that. Right. Especially if you're alone physically in prison or, you know, in a very bad situation. And I'm just curious. I lost my my brother's wife of 35 years, died last year of cancer at 57 years old, very young and just suddenly just came and took her. And I'm just curious, you know, when your mother passed, you know, I'm sure she had when you have cancer, you know, it's coming. So you have time to prepare. And I went through this with my sister-in-law and it was at first, I thought it was kind of scary and sad, and it turned out to be a beautiful experience as she talked with everybody, and we knew this was happening. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, your mother no doubt had some great sense of peace 
You know, people don't go to the grave kicking and screaming in most cases, right? They've made peace with their life. And I'm, I'm, I wonder where she got that peace. You know, and I always wonder that about people. Where do they find that? It can be an inner thing. It can be a God thing. It can be, it might be a Bart Simpson thing. I don't know, but people all got to find that peace. Yeah. Well, uh, again, we, we're, we're kind of getting away from sales here, but I know for my mom, she had cancer for 10 years. So technically she was a cancer survivor, even though, um, you know, it kept coming back and that side of things. And she had great peace. And this is motivation for me. And I did the kind of, uh, I think you call it a eulogy. Like I did a, a speak at the a talk at the funeral and stuff. And one of the things that she mentioned um, before she passed away was just how proud of me and my two brothers that she was. She never, never mentioned my dad. I don't know how proud of, uh, of him she is or was. Um, but I mentioned then again, not being religious, but having to not having to, but choosing to speak at the church. I started talking about um, kind of DNA. So for everyone who was missing her, me and my brothers were literally 50 odd percent of her. And that was kind of her legacy. And that was something that she, so she, she was a pharmacist or pharmacy technician. So she wasn't kind of, you know, a business person, entrepreneur or anything like that. Um, but she was a crazy lady and um, would talk to anyone and, and all that side of things. So she, her funeral, it was th there'll be more people at her funeral than mine. I, I know that for a fact. The place was rammed. There was a queue outside to get in. It was crazy. So with contribution, she had left contribution of making people smile and just having engaging conversations with individuals and, and looking after them and mothering people without even realizing it. And, um, and so that was a kind of nice, uh, come round and, and that does relate to the conversation, whether she was at peace or not, I don't know. Uh, difficult to get in someone's brain uh, at that kind of point. Um, but yeah, that, that was, a that was an interesting one for me to see that, uh, not even, I'll, I'll say like even a, and I'm doing this somewhat sarcastically, but a, a lowly, um, kind of a technician in a hospital, you know, still gave that much that I think there was like 600 people at the funeral. There was that many people there. It was incredible. So that leaves us, you know, no matter how old we are watching this, right, that contribution is something that we can always work on. And I think it's Gary Vaynerchuk bangs on about this. He's like less bothered about how much money he has in the bank. And he's more concerned about leaving such a legacy that there's, you know, so many people want to go to his funeral that they all can't fit in on a kind of a grand scale. And perhaps that's a good way to look at things. And, and to is that a good way to look at things and try and motivate ourselves? That's a great question. I was thinking about Dr. Covey's book, Seven Habits. Uh, when you mentioned that, one of the things he recommends people do to get clear on their personal purpose is to imagine your funeral. What would you want your spouse to say, your kids, your coworkers, right? And, you know, what would you have them say? And when you think about the things you want them to say, you realize what's really important to you. When I first went through that exercise in 1996, I pictured my funeral. And at that time, the only one I envisioned there was my son, who was three years old. But I visioned him as a grown man at my funeral one day and coming up to the lectern and saying, you know, my dad was the richest convict ever. And I realized that's not what I want my son to say. Right. Because at that time, I thought it was all about creating wealth and I could stay out of prison. When I realized that that's not what I want my son to say, I had to think, what do I really want him to say? And you know what I came with? I came up with I want my son to be able to say it. Matthew. He's 26 years old now. I want him to be able to say my dad. Uh, changed his life about halfway through his life. And when he changed his life, he made me a promise that he would never lie to me again and he would never leave me again. And my father kept those promises until the day he died. If my son can say that when I die, then it's mission accomplished for me. Tell you what, Weldon, we're going deeper than what I expected on this show. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's pull things back to sales and consistency just for a second. We can go down another rabbit hole in this if we choose to. Um, but for someone who's listening to this and they're going, okay, right, um, you know, hopefully someone's people are somewhat emotionally charged after listening to this. They're going, this is the time I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to, I'm going to stick to it. This is out of the 500 new year's resolutions that I've had consistency in X, Y, or Z, or, um, kind of perhaps being consistent across money relationships and, and health, like choosing one thing is, uh, after this conversation that they're geared up to do that. What practically can we do to implement this? Cause you mentioned the word habit, for example, what should we be doing to make these things stick and take it away from perhaps willpower and turn it into something like brushing our teeth that we do every day? Well, I'm glad you mentioned willpower because uh, scientifically studies have shown that willpower is an exhaustible resource, right? You can, you can really force feed yourself something for a short time, but over a short amount of time, hours or days that breaks down and you have to fall back on habits, right? What are we doing habitually? So it's actually a really simple process. It's going to blow you away. I, uh, this My book, The Power of Consistency, outlines this whole process in detail. 
But the thing I always warn people is that don't mistake its simplicity uh, for it not being powerful because it's so simple. People awful over overlook it, but it's so powerful it can move mountains. So I call the process the upside of fear. And fear is an acronym for focus, emotional commitment, action, and responsibility. The upside of fear, by the way, is also the title of my first book. So here's the fear process. Step number one, you got to get focused, obviously. What do I really want? A lot of times people go through life not exactly sure where they want to go. They want happiness. They want success. But these are kind of vague terms, specifically in your money, which is your career, your financial security, that type of thing, your relationships, which is your family, your community, your friends, and your health, your mental, spiritual, and physical health. What do you specifically want to achieve in those areas? You know, the classic book, Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, uh, the very first thing that he talked about in that book that was a habit of the most successful people is that they all had a definite purpose. They had specificity in what they wanted. So get, get clear. What is your financial goal? Is it to earn 200000 a year? Is it to retire at 50 years old? Is it to buy a house on a lake? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. Just be specific, right? In your relationships, what do you want? Uh, my very first prosperity plan, by the way, the very first list of goals I wrote out, I put it on a sheet of paper and I stuck it to the wall of my cell with toothpaste. And the very first thing on that list said, I am an awesome father to my son. Now, it wasn't true yet, obviously. These are aspirations. Dr. Covey said we have to learn to live out of our imagination, not out of our past. And so I was living out of my imagination. I'm wealthy beyond my wildest dreams. I'm an awesome father to my son. And then what do you want physically? Do you want to run a half marathon? Do you want to weigh 180 pounds? Maybe it's a spiritual goal. You want to be a deacon in your church, right? Maybe it's a philosophical goal. You want to be Frederick Nietzsche, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is, but what is important to you with either your physical, spiritual, or emotional health? And you simply identify specifically what you want. One money goal, keep it simple. One, maybe two financial goals, one or two relationship goals, one or two health goals. Then you simply have to ask yourself a simple question. What do I need to do every day to achieve these goals? Now, the key here is to limit it to one or two things. What one or two things could you do every single day to move closer to your financial goal? What one or two things every day could you do to move closer to that relationship goal? What one or two things could you do every day to move towards finishing that marathon? The reality is, Lao Tzu said, a thousand mile journey begins with what? A single step. But we get so overwhelmed. And we get the paralysis through analysis. We start thinking, well, what am I going to do the 50th step? What am I going to do the 100th? Don't worry about it. All you have to do is figure specifically what do you want and what's the first one or two things that you have to do. That's the focus step. The next step is emotional commitment. you got to get deeply emotionally committed to the things you want and the things you need to do. Again, Napoleon Hill said after you have uh, clarity of purpose or definiteness of, definiteness of purpose, as he referred to it, you have to have a burning desire. I call that an emotional commitment. How do you get an, an emotional commitment? This is where we really start rewiring the brain. The key is to write out the things you want and the things you need to do. So I earn $200,000 a year. I run every call with passion and purpose. I ask for the order every single time. Two simple things that if I do every single call, I'm probably going to move towards my financial goal, right? So you write those things out. I'm an awesome father to my son. I love and respect and honor my son. I give him my most valuable asset, which is my time. One or two things, if I do every day, I'm going to be a great father. So you simply write these things out in present current tense. Your entire plan, in my estimation, should fit on one page so you can keep it in front of you, right? So you can stay focused. That's the key. Then we got to start putting those things. We got to start rewiring the brain with those things. How do we do that? Well, I call it a quiet time ritual. It's 15 minutes a day reading and reviewing and visualizing that list. Now, we don't have time to go to the neurology, but what I can tell you is that by doing this on a consistent basis, it reconstructs, rewires the neural connectors to where these new things on this sheet of paper, they become your expectations. They become the value system. They become the thing. You got to make it another strand of your DNA. So every day when I would get up, I would look at that list on my wall. I didn't know the neuroscience behind all this at the time, but I would review that list. I would imagine what it would be like to be that man, to, to have that life. And over time, my brain began to recreate those expectations. Seven years later, I walked out of prison and the thought of not building a successful company and being a good person was like not, it was foreign to me at that point, right? 
So those are the first two steps. If you, if you, I can pause here if you have a question no, too about that. Can... You keep going. This is amazing. Okay. So again, I told you it was simple, right? Yeah. Yeah. I told you it was simple. That's why so so many people overlook it. It's funny when the power of consistency came out. I got a call from a guy named Ed Nottingham. He's a PhD and a clinical psychologist. He's written a couple of books of his own, the mindset, and he works for FedEx, as you know, a global company, right? Fifty billion dollars. And he calls me up and he says, "Mr. Long, I got to tell you." This book, The Power of Consistency, is the simplest explanation of the neuroscience behind success and the principles that are the underpinnings of rational emotive behavior therapy I've ever read in my life. And I said, there's a name for this? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's common sense, right? I just read all the historical books, right? Some new, some old. So you, you figure out what you want, what you got to do. You write it out. You review it for a few minutes every single day. But here's the key, and you'll see why this is so important in the action step. You have to get yourself deeply emotionally committed as you read those things. You can't just read it from rote. You have to get emotionally connected. Again, it's the emotions that trigger our actions, right? It, it, neurologically, your thoughts trigger your emotions, emotions trigger your actions, actions trigger your results. So you gotta get so deeply committed emotionally that it starts driving new behaviors. Let me give you an example. The first thing on my list was that I'm an awesome father to my son. He was three years old. Seven years later, I got out of prison. I get custody of my son. He's 10 years old, and I raise him. When he's 18 years old, he goes off to college. When my son goes off to college, we didn't make a big deal about it. He was just going to school at University of Colorado a couple hours away. But we get to the dorm where he's going to be living, and we walk in, and this lady checks his name off of the list, and she turns to my son, and she says, mandatory housing meeting, 3 o'clock. And I said, yes, ma'am, we'll be here. And she looks at me, and she says, no, you won't. At 3 o'clock, he's a grown man. No parents allowed. And all of a sudden it hits me, well, this is a huge day, right? So we go around campus, we get him all squared away with his classes, his books, set his dorm room up. At 2.45, we're out in front of the dorm. And I'm so proud of my son. He's been through so much, and he's, he's, he's a really good, decent person. I put my arms around him, I give him a big hug, and I tell my son, I said, son, my greatest wish for you is that one day you will have a son that you love the way I love you, because that's the only way you're ever going to know what it feels like to be your dad. Of course, he's 18 years old. There's kids around everywhere. He's kind of embarrassed. He's like, Dad, what's the matter with you today? <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you sick? Are you dying? And I said, no, son, everything's right as rain. But 15 years ago, your grandfather died. And I made a promise to myself to be the father you deserved. And, and it's really worked out. And I put my hands on his shoulders. And I said, son, words cannot even describe how much I love you and how proud I am of the man you've become. And my son looks at me dead in the eyes, 18-year-old man. He takes my hands off his shoulder. He puts them down by my side. And he puts his hands on my shoulders and he gets right up in my face. And my son says to me, he says, no, dad, I'm proud of the man you finally became. That moment with my son was beyond sublime. But you know what the crazy part was? The way it felt in that moment, the love, the understanding, the, the recognition that we made it. It felt the same way that it felt 15 years earlier when I was pretending it alone in a prison cell. That's what Napoleon Hill said, a burning desire for your dreams a deep emotional commitment. It's got to become so deep in a part of you, it drives everything you do. That's the emotional commitment part. Now, let me tell you why it's so important in the action step next. Action is where the rubber meets the road, right? Will Rogers said it, even if you're on the right path in life, you'll get run over if you just sit there. We got to move towards those goals. We got we to engage in those actions. Well, there's a little thing called cognitive dissonance, which we all know, and it's basically uh, a primary driver of, of human behavior. Dissonance is the anxiety between something we say and something we do. So if you tell me you're going to pick me up at the mall at three o'clock and then you forget and you look down at your watch, it's 315, that anxiety you feel, that's called cognitive dissonance. So you want to get rid of the dissonance because the human condition wants to be back in a state of resonance. So how do you get back to a state of resonance? You do the thing you said you would do. You turn the car around, you feel better. You come get me with friends again, right? Think about that and think about this. Suppose you get up in the morning and you're reviewing your prosperity plan and your morning quiet time ritual you visualize yourself earning $200,000 a year. You visualize yourself running every call with passion and purpose. You visualize yourself asking for the order every single time. And then a few hours later, you go out in your first call. You walk in, you write up a quick bid, and you drop it off and walk out. What do you think you're going to feel? You're going to feel cognitive dissonance because that's not what you visualized and told yourself that morning. So you feel like a fish out of water. So you go on your next call, you remember that. Like, that didn't feel good. So what do you got to do? You've got to do the thing you said you would do. You run the call with passion and purpose. You ask the word every single time. So it's the ultimate and personal responsibility because the quiet time ritual through the cognitive dissonance starts driving the behaviors 
that we've already decided if I do these things, I'm going to get these things. So now I'm habitually, automatically doing these things because I'm telling myself every single day to do them. The final step is responsibility. It's a very simple concept that we all have problems in life, but your problems do not define your life. Your decisions about your problems define your life. And who's responsible for those decisions? Me. If it is to be, it's up to me. So focus, figure out what you want, what you got to do. Emotional commitment, write it down, review it for 15 minutes every day. Action, let Mother Nature do her job. Dissonance will keep you on track. And then understand that your problems don't define you. Your decisions about your problems define you. And we are 100% responsible for that. So that, in a nutshell, is the upside of fear. Simple process, but very powerful. Well, for sure you blew minds here and you're kind of getting the audience fired up with this, Weldon. One thing that came to mind of all of this is what are the time frames that we should be aiming towards here? Is this a, you know, clearly you're, you're, you're talking about your son and there's a, there's a definite timeline of that or of when he's a man, when he, when, when, when he can have these conversations back with you, when he, when you can see your work into him and him becoming a, you know, a good lad a, a, as a young kid or whatever it is, is this, is it, is the answer it depends or should we be looking at one year goals, 10 year goals, 50 year goals, a, a mix of all of them? How do we go about, um, cause that's, I guess that's the, the, the key point here of if I set a 20 year goal and I've talked about this on the show in the past, so that I want to fund and my contribution is going to be scientific research into different things, which you know I've talked about on a previous show, so I won't dive into it in too much detail, but that's definitely a 20 year goal. So that's, that's there's, there's, as much as I want to kind of be rah, rah and, and then discuss the, and, and get psyched up about the fact that I could blow things up and expand the business and start this. It's probably 20 years away. Is, is that the kind of range that we're looking for? Or do we need a mix of um, things to be passionate about? Cause we want to see yeah. results, right? And that gives us kind of a, a feedback loop. Yeah, that's a great question. And so there's really three kind of goals in, 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 my, in my estimation, to keep it simple. There's long-term, uh, what you're talking about within the 20-year plan. There's shorter term, which could be one to three years. And then there's what I call current goals. In other words, being an awesome father to my son starts right now, right? I don't have to wait to get there. Um, so, so I've got things on there that are just the current goals that go to who I want to be as a person on every basis. I've got, for personally, I've got a, a one-year income goal. And then I've got a long-term financial goal. So yes, it could be a combination of those. So you might, you know, if your goal is to make $10 million, it's going to be longer term than if it is to make the first hundred thousand of that. So yeah, definitely long-term, short-term, and then what I call current, you know, goals. Who do you want to be today? What can you accomplish today? The key thing is by doing this on an ongoing basis, you're going to start driving the behaviors. I will tell you this, you've all heard the old expression, it takes about 30 days for something to become a habit, these new activities. There's a great story in John Ashraf's book, The Answer, about these astronauts in a spacecraft, and they put goggles on them to turn their vision upside down, right, where they were training. And after 30 days, their vision corrected because it took the brain about 30 days to carve new neural connectors. And so that's why it takes the brain about 30 days to catch up with the new behaviors, new habits. So you got to have a little bit of patience during that time frame. But in terms of how long it takes to reach the goal, you know, you're going to have short-term, long-term, and current stuff that you're working on. Amazing stuff. Well, final thing to kind of wrap on here, Weldon, and 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 I don't know what your take is on this because some people will say we should go go for broke and go huge. Some people perhaps would say we should go for sensible, not necessarily sensible, but slightly above sensible. How big should these goals be? Because I use the cliche all the time. If you see people are on Instagram going from seemingly going from nothing to you know ten million in revenue and buying Ferraris, Porsches, Lamborghinis, whatever it is. And then clearly they're using that lifestyle to sell product or service on the back of it. Um, so there's, there's more elements to this than kind of what meets the eye in a lot of, of a lot of scenarios. But for me being 32, I'm at the top end of the kind of millennial group. Uh, my brother is uh, kind of a, I've got a middle brother and a younger brother. He's on the bottom end. And I know he is somewhat susceptible to seeing these individuals and be like, well, I could just do this like them. And six months down the line, without that much hard work, I'm going to have achieved X, Y, Z. How do we, how big should we set our goals is question one. And kind of in, in the same question is, should we, I guess, sh should we be going for broke with all of this or should we be kind of realistic with our goal setting? Uh, I am not a huge fan of being realistic. Think about my life for a second. What would have been a realistic goal 22 years ago when I was sitting in prison? What would have been realistic? Maybe getting out of prison, getting a decent job, maybe have a visitation with my son, you know, that would have been, that would have been realistic, but I'm a big fan of dreaming big, right? 
I was dreaming of a house in Maui. I was dreaming of a house in the mountains. I was dreaming of wealth and prosperity. And my son, all these amazing things. And within a few years of getting out, I got out of prison. I was living in a homeless shelter in January of 2003, 16 years ago. I was living in a homeless shelter. By 2007, I had a house on Maui, right? I believe in dreaming big. And here's why. If we got just another minute, the reticular activating system is a filter in your brain. It filters out things that are relevant to you so you can focus on what's relevant to you. Like right now, until I mentioned that coffee cup by your hand, you probably weren't thinking about it, right? Because the fact it was there wasn't relevant. But what if it had been a rattlesnake? Wouldn't you have been noticing that? You would have just ignored Yeah. You'd have been keeping your eye on it because your well-being depends on you watching, right? Well, that's what the reticular activating system does. Things that don't matter, it filters them out so we can focus on what does matter, like this conversation, for example. But here's the thing. Suppose your expectation is you're going to make a $200,000 a year. That's what I'm doing. That's my dream. I'm going to make 200 grand a year. And then a half a million dollar idea comes past you. If you think it's not relevant to you, the reticular activating system will say, well, that's not relevant to us. We're looking for ways to make 200 grand a year. So listen, there's a thing I write about, and we haven't even talked about my new book. Maybe we can do in the podcast sometime and talk about that. But in my, in the power of consistency, uh, I was just writing an article for a trade magazine this morning. And I started the article with this quote from the book, your results will never exceed your expectations and your expectations will never exceed your imagination, right? So your results are limited by what you expect. You're never going to accidentally make $5 million. Those things happen on purpose, right? So I, I believe in big dreams. I, I believe in imagination, you know, just big as the whole universe. I thought you were going to say that. Uh, well done, Dan. So I'm, gl I'm glad I asked you, mate, because this is something I'm working on of going from, and it's it's almost um, society's expectations, your parents and kind of their wealth and how that translates to kind of what you feel uh, listen, comfortable I, with. I write extensively and speak extensively about limiting beliefs, ideas that other people put in our head 20, 30, 40 years ago, and they didn't even do it directly. It was just kind of indirect because we kind of assume their beliefs, right? They didn't say you have to think like me, but Hey, if my dad was middle income, I guess we're middle income people, right? So you got to make sure examining limiting beliefs is a big part of the focus step. We didn't have time to talk about it today. We could speak for two days just on limiting beliefs. <laughs> well, right? we'll, we'll definitely have you there. back on, Weldon, to dive into this into more I'd detail. Love, I'd um, love to come. I really enjoyed this conversation. Well, I've got one final question for you, mate. That's something that I ask everyone that comes on the show. And I'm, I'm genuinely fascinated to hear your answer with all your experience uh, that you've kind of just briefly touched on in this episode. And the question is, mate, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Better at selling. The, the most important thing that I tell people when I'm working with a sales group is that you got to do everything in your power. You won't always be able to do it. And you always have to be respectful and polite and professional when you do it. But you got to do everything in your power to try to get your prospect to make a final decision about you and your company with you in front of them or on the phone. You don't want them making a decision about you and your products with you away from the situation because then it comes down to a number between you and someone else. If you can get people to make, now I teach the whole process on how to do this. You have to know how to do it. That's what consistency selling is all about. How do you, how do you approach the sales call? I don't approach the sales call with the mindset of selling the deal. I approach the, the sales call with the mindset of doing everything in my power to position the conversation so that my prospect will make a final decision about me at the end, even if it's no. In fact, I tell my, my prospects, no is a perfectly acceptable answer. So the key is to try to get them. You can't always do it because some people refuse to make a decision one way or the other. That's fine. But in most cases, you can get people to reach a final decision about you and your company while you're still in front of them. And you give them permission to say no. You don't want them to feel cornered or pressured. No is a perfectly accept acceptable answer. But just let me to know today whether or not you think I'm a good fit for you and your family. Simple thing. Well, with that well done, uh, it's been an absolute joy chatting with you, mate. Um, this episode, I was looking forward to it because, as I said, consistency is at the forefront of my mind personally, but you, you've you blown it away. With that, tell us, we touched on the book, but tell us a little bit more about the books and where we can find out more about you as well. Yeah, so my first book, as I mentioned, was The Upside of Fear. The Power of Consistency is the mindset, and then consistency selling is the sales model. Uh, I would encourage your listeners and your viewers uh, to text in the word videos video or videos to 96,000. And if you're international and you can't do it, just go to my website, weldonlong.com, and there's a banner at the top. And either way you do it, uh, you'll get about an hour's worth of three videos I created. The first one's on the prosperity mindset, a lot of what we talked about today. 
The other two are how do you get people to make a final decision about you on a sales call? So it's a free video series. It's about an hour long. You can text videos to 96,000 or go to weldonlong.com and just you'll see a big orange banner across the top. You click on that, put in your info, and we'll send it to you. And, of course, they can check out the books and the website on Amazon uh, and those, those types of places. Perfect. Well, I'll link to everything that we talked about for anyone who's on a treadmill, anyone who's driving at the moment, trying to scribble things down and not crash the car. We'll do it over at salesman.org forward slash consistency. That'll be the, the link for this episode of the show. And with that, well done. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the show, mate. I really appreciate this uh, conversation. You're a complete legend. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you, my friend. It's been a real, a real treat. I appreciate it. 